this is a whole pig, and what we're going to do is we're going to first break it down to primals, and then we'll break the primals down into fabricated cuts from there. So starting up in the head, the usable parts that come out of the head, you would kind of make a cut right here. This is the jowl, the ears, uh, the full head is utilizable, utilized, you can be utilized. This is the snout, um, this is the, the garnish that you'd find traditionally in mortadella. Um, then we go down to here, this would be between ribs number one and two, we'd separate the Boston butt from the pork loin, which would go all the way down here. Uh, so we'd have the Boston butt at the top, then we'd have the picnic cam in this area right here, and then below that we'd have the trotters. So trotters, picnic cam, Boston butt, and then we'd have the Boston butt going back here from rib number two all the way back here. This is the fresh ham. About midline right here, we'd have the belly or bacon on the outside, and then on the inside, we'd have the spare ribs, and we'll look at those in a second. Back here, we'd have the fresh ham. This is the fresh ham. Back to about here, this is where we'd have our hawks, and then we'd have our trotters. So the beautiful thing about the pig, especially a pig like this, is there's nothing that's wasted. We're going to utilize everything from this pig, and it's going to be delicious. So now what I'm going to do is uh, we'll talk about the skeletal structure real quick. So down here, this is where we have the foot. Going into here, this is where we have the, the tibia fibula, and then going from the tibia fibula into the femur. And then the femur would go into the H bone or pelvis. And then we come up the spinal column. Back here, you, you'll hear me make reference to this a lot. The feather bones are the ridges in the spinal cord. And then you come all the way up into here. When we get into this area, this is where the scapula is. The scapula is connected to the humerus. The humerus is connected to the radius and ulna right here. And then you get into the, into the trotter as well. Right? Um, so now what we're going to do is open it up and look at it from the inside. So once we get on the inside, we have a little different view. So up here, this is where the head is. This in is where you feed the, see the thymus gland or the sweetbreads. Um, these are the feather bones here. Right? This is the chine bone. And in the center of the chine bone is where the spinal cord would be. We come down the chine, back down to this area. This is where the coccyx, the coccyx goes into the tail. Um, you can see this is the bottom portion of the pelvis the, called the pubic arcuate. And the upper portion where it connects, so the bottom is where it connects here. Where it connects up on the back side is called the sacroiliac and is where it connects into the spinal column. Um, this is where this is where the femur is located, and this is where you'd have your tibia fibula, and then it goes down into the trotter again. Uh, and then those are just bones that we'll that we'll make reference to as as we're fabricating. So now the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to put it back together and we're going to remove the head. Come in to remove the head, so we're just going to kind of follow the fattiness of the cheeks. We're going to come around this way, so we're going to come back this way. Uh, what I like to do is put the head on the edge of the table, because then as it falls down, I can kind of use gravity to get myself in there. What I'm looking for is the joint. And so as I pull the head down, you can see where the joint is right here. And you'll see that I pop that atlas and axis joint. And I'm just gonna follow that head down. I'm gonna come in up here, do the same thing. So You're alive. Cool, so back to the head. So we're removing the head. So this is the atlas and axis joint. The coolest thing about this joint, this is one of the coolest parts about robotics is trying to mimic this joint because one goes one way and one goes the other. So what I'm doing is I'm holding my head under, holding my hand underneath the head so I don't want to drop it when I cut it. That's always embarrassing. Uh, and then I'll just cut that off and then we have our head off. So there's our head. Little cutie. <laughs> nice cheeks. So this is the grandmother cheeks, Aww. cheek pincher. So that goes over there. But you can look at the, look at the side of that. It has awesome fat, incredible marbling. Uh, it's just, it's delicious. Nice, silky, smooth fat. Awesome. Is we're gonna open it back up. So we're gonna open it up like this. Boom. What that's gonna allow us to do, because they have scored the carcass right here, what that allowed us to do is, instead of having to come back and, and separate it, we can just follow, we just have to cut through the skin. We're just gonna cut through right here so we can open it up all the way. So I'm gonna take that knife here and I'm gonna come in right here and they didn't cut through the bone all the way. So if you don't have a bone saw, it's an, an excellent excuse to grab a bone saw. So now we're just gonna take the bone saw and cut through that bone. And then once you get down through it, then we can finish the rest with a knife. <clears throat> so we'll just come in here and just follow that cut down. Cool. Uh, this is also, there's the other ear. 
We lost an ear. <laughs> so we have an ear over here. Pop that pack. Uh, but here's another awesome view of the fat. So you can see the fat back on this. So it's about, it looks like it's about two inches thick or so. Uh, beautiful fat there. Just follow. Cool. And we can follow that down. And now we have it, we'll have it split in two halves. Then it's just a little easier to deal with. So that piece comes off. Uh, and then basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift this onto another table and then we'll go ahead and fabricate one half from there. All right, so now on the inside of the pig, we took the other half off. You can see that awesome marbling. Uh, if you could feel the fat, it's super smooth and silky, and that's a really good quality, in the, especially in the heritage breeds. These are the feather bones that come off here, and these weren't cut directly in half, and that's why they kind of stick up and they're not incomplete, which is not bad, um, but it's just ideally when that's kind of your guideline to split it in half, but that's gonna be our guideline for breaking it down. First thing we're gonna do is pull the fat out of the inside. And you can literally just get in underneath this fat and pull it up and off. This is where it becomes a full contact sport because I'll pull it into my belly so I'm not chasing it across the table. Uh, and for the most part, it should just peel right out. So we'll just peel this out. And this is where you get your lard. Um, this is really nice clean fat for adding to sausages. It's very neutral in flavor, uh, has a lot of moisture, but we can pull that out. So this is the fat. We're just going to take that out and save that in our rendering pile. Uh, if it's not coming out just by pulling it, then come back and cut it out a little bit. But you just keep coming underneath it and pull that fat all the way out. Uh, this is also when it really becomes kind of prevalent that you want to cut it cold um, and you want to let it set, especially after dispatch, you want to let it hang out for a couple days and let it chill out. Uh, once this fat is cold, it's much easier to deal with. And we'll just follow that fat right out. <coughs> and off, all that fat comes out. And of course, nothing is going to be wasted, so that's going to go to our rendering pile right over here. Uh, have, you ever, have you seen the show, The Farm and Chef and Farmer? Chef. Yeah. Uh, she does a great one on cracklins, pork cracklins. Yeah. Uh, where they, they're outside doing it in a big uh, pot. Takes them all day. It's awesome. All right, so now we got all that fat out, and now we can see a little bit more about what's going on on the inside. So when we get up here on the inside and we kind of press it out a little bit more, this is kind of what we're used to seeing when we see a pig. Um, generally not used to seeing the whole carcass. But what we can see when we see this is we can see a little bit more clearly where the skirt steak or diaphragm is. Um, this is the skirt steak or diaphragm or the residual pieces of the skirt steak. And that actually would go right around here all the way up to this muscle right here. This muscle right here is the hanger steak or the, what's left of it. The hanger steak is a two lobe muscle that hangs off the spinal column. One side works in conjunction with this side of the diaphragm and this side works in conjunction with this side of the diaphragm. And that works with this thin membrane here and that's how it regulates the, ca the capacity of the chest. Um, and it looks like this, but it's a delicious piece that this one's been removed before. <clears throat> cool, so next thing that we can do is we can go ahead and separate the shoulder. So the pork shoulder, uh, kind of the cornerstone of uh, smoking or barbecue world in the Piedmont part of North Carolina uh, is basically the Boston butt and the picnic camp still connected and it's never never bad to throw in a little trotter and some hawks because it's just going to be smoky goodness that you can put into a stock or into your beans or whatever but we're going to look for rib number one which is right here C cut that out so you can see it a little bit more clearly so this is rib number one right here and this is rib number two so we're going to first score it so I'll just score it. I like to make some guidelines so I know what I'm doing and where I'm going, at least when I'm cutting meat. Uh, and then I'm gonna take the, uh, the saw and I'm just gonna score. I'm gonna cut through the chine bone. The chine bone is the center of the spinal column, a little bit of feather bone, and a little bit of the sternum. So once I get through those, and I hear that, so now the, the, the bone saw has actually gone down to the scapula and I'm gonna pull that back. So 
So now I'm through the scapula. So I flip that over and we cut that remainder out. You can see kind of a cool classic cut called a seven bone steak as well. And a seven bone is basically the shape of the scapula so that you can kind of see that seven right there. So that's the seven. So that's called a seven bone steak. Very popular in beef, um, but not impossible to do with pork. It's a great piece for like a, a pot roast, Yankee pot roast. But again, nice marbling. This is the part. Beautiful. This would be basically a, uh, a shoulder chop or a shoulder ribeye. If we think about the old school chop shops, this is what they get from lamb and this is the delicious part of it. It has a tremendous amount of connective tissue. Um, you can cut a nice steak out of there. But here's the feather bones, chine bone, rib number one. This is the scapula. Then the scapula would go down to the humerus. Humerus is then connected to the radius and ulna. Then it goes down into the trotter. So this is a pork shoulder. Delicious. Cool. And nutritious. Okay. All right, so we'll slide that shoulder over here. Go into the next primal. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna separate the loin. We're gonna leave the loin and the bacon or belly intact and we're gonna take the fresh ham off. So when we come back here, we're basically looking for this. This is the pubic arcuate, or the inside part of the H-bone, okay? And we're gonna cut kind of across like this at an angle. What we're doing, or what we're looking at is how to extend our belly out. So this part has a nice amount of, of, of fat and meat in it, so we don't wanna lose it. So we could trim that belly back, and then we could cut that off, and that's gonna give us a better yield. So we're gonna come in here, and I'm just gonna kind of trim around the shape of that that fresh ham. The fresh ham is kind of like the shape of a basketball. So you can kind of see, this is our fresh ham right here. That's the, the bulk of what we're looking at. So when we're thinking about prosciutto, or we're thinking about a country ham, this is what we're talking about here. Um, and we want to get as much out of that as possible. We also don't want to lose the potential yield on our bacon. So we want to cut that back a little bit so we can get a better yield on our bacon. <clears throat> so once we get that out of the way, now we're going to come back and use our saw, and we're basically gonna come kind of like right here. Yeah. This is kind of a cool thing. This is called the femoral artery. The femoral artery is the artery that goes down into the lower extremities from this point forward. So if you wounded yourself, you'd always, they'd always say, apply pressure to your femoral artery, the inside of your thigh. What that does is, in, bri in the brining world, we can actually open that vein up that artery, insert an arterial brining pump and pump the brine into it, and it pumps up like a balloon. It's really cool. So it uses the natural system of uh, blood vessels to carry it in without deteriorating the muscle fiber, so it's pretty sweet. Fun with needles. So the bone saw is awesome, um, but as its name suggests, it goes right through flesh and muscle and stops on bone. So if you happen to be on the bad side of it, <clears throat> it'll get you pretty good. So don't mess around with the bone saw. And then once you get through the bone, you can just finish that cut out here. So now what I'm doing is I'm using the, the H bone. There's a little hole in the H bone. I'm gonna hold that up and I'm just gonna cut through the skin to remove my fresh hand and tail. <laughs> that makes it more authentic. Yeah. yeah. You can make some jewelry from it or a little goatee. <laughs> uh, so that's the tail. Tail is a great one for brining and smoking as well. Um, this is delicious. If you ever had oxtail, this, this comes out really nice. Um, it's got a lot of connective tissue in it, so it, it translates after a moist heat application to deliciousness. Um, but it also adds a lot of flavor to your beans or your stock. Or, uh, it's also collagen rich, so it gives you a really thick, viscousy stock. So that's the tail. Then our fresh ham. I was like the fresh hand up. It always reminds me of the lamp in um, Christmas Carol. <laughs> this would be the less <laughs> offensive to your, you know, your counterpart. <laughs> um, all right. So now what we have is this is the loin. Uh, this is where we get our pork chops from. Or if we wanted to get fancy and call it a pork ribeye, this is where this would come from. Down here where the ribs end, this is rib number 13 back here. Um, at the 13th rib, that's where your short loin would begin if we were talking about beef or making a comparison. So this is where you see the tenderloin here. 
This is where you would get a porterhouse steak. So if you wanted to cut a T-bone, you can see the skinny part of that tenderloin there. That's where you get a T-bone. And then when you get into that really thick part of the filet, that's where you get a pork chop. I mean, a, sorry, a porterhouse. Um, but a porterhouse just sounds much more sexy than a pork uh, chop. So we did we incorporate those names into that. Uh, oh, I lost my knife for a second. That's never something you want to do, lose your knife. So we just cut more of that fat out so we can see it a little bit better. And the fat, again, we're not, we're not letting go of that. That's good stuff. We're gonna render that out. So what I like to do is come in and cut the spare ribs now, or if I wanted to do a long bone chop, I would cut the bacon off. So we would cut down from the outside to the chops, cut that off, and then come back and, and clean those up so we had some long bone chops. But I'll just show you on this one how we would get a traditional spare rib and, and bacon out of it. So what I'm doing here is I'm looking at kind of the shortest rib in the in the point so we got 13 here so i'm going to make a, a score right across here and then i'm going to follow that through so now that separates my bacon from my from my loin uh, and now i'm going to take the saw it's easier to saw it when it's attached to something once you take it off it's a little bit more difficult unless you had a sawzall i'm not a huge fan of the sawzall because meat goes from awesome to not so awesome real quick and what I'm doing is I'm applying pressure on the sternum, which causes it to open up more naturally. And just following my line down. And I now I can I heard I cut through the last rib. So I saw back over there. And now I can line it up on my cutting board again. Follow my score line down. And that'll separate my loin from my bacon. Really key to have a sharp knife when you're cutting uh, so that when you do cut yourself, it heals much faster. Cool, so there's bacon and there's the loin. So this is bacon with the spare ribs attached and that you, that's awesome bacon. Look at that fat on that belly. Super, super cool. Um, uh, this would also be a good candidate for curing it like a pancetta or making lardo, um, but curing that fat. But what we're gonna do now is, and anytime you see pictures, the pictures don't do justice what, what's actually happening here. You can see the bacon on the outside and these are the spare ribs, but on the pictures you can't really see it. All you see are these tiny little nubs. So. This gives us an opportunity to come in and follow those ribs down. So these are the spare ribs. And we're gonna follow the spare ribs down to the sternum. And what I do when I'm cutting is I use my index finger and my thumb as a wedge. I always call it the chest spreader. Freaks people out a little bit, but... Um, but what I do is I use it to kind of open that up so it makes it a little bit easier to see what's going on. And I'm gonna follow that down and follow it off. Cool. Uh, and then when you get spare ribs, there's a couple different ways to get spare ribs. Most common ones just as spare ribs. Uh, second one is, is generally called St. Louis style. And St. Louis style means that the sternum has been removed. So we're just gonna set this to the side for one second. A big piece. So when we're looking at the spare ribs, we have the spare ribs that look like that when they come off. Um, when we're eating ribs, no one likes to deal with the ribs being connected. So you wanna think about how you can make it as easy as possible to eat. And when you look at the ribs, there's connected tissue that goes all the way down here and then it goes into the sternum where it's connected. So it, it tastes delicious. If it's cooked right, that part gets nice and crispy and you just kind of chew it and spit it out, but it's not, it's not very, you know, ladylike, I guess, if you're at a barbecue. Um, so we're gonna cut it out and make it more ladylike. I guess, that's what we're doing. Um, and I don't take the, the skirt steak off either. So I'll leave that skirt steak on. Uh, and then if you eat spare ribs and you get the bonus, uh, you'll you'll be spoiled because you'll want it every time because this this part just get translates to super tastiness <clears throat> It's a very technical term super tastiness 
Um, so this is the sternum right here. Now, if we had a butcher block, I would just hold onto it with a cleaver and smack it, but I don't have a butcher block. And I, uh, so we're gonna use the saw, the next best thing to a cleaver. This is where it gets fun. Bone saws are much different than just a, uh, it looks like a, what am I trying to say, a hacksaw, but the teeth on a bone saw are actually angled back, whereas on a bone, on a, on a hacksaw, they're straight or they're actually forward. So the pull or the power is in pulling back, and that's kind of weird when people start using it. Um, but this is gonna go to my bone pile, and this is great. Pork bones are invaluable in stocks. It's a younger animal, they're collagen rich, so they have a very neutral flavor. Um, they take a roast really well, but they make a super incredibly rich gelatinous stock. So don't let anyone tell you differently. Pork bones are awesome for stock. <clears throat> um, here, we're gonna flip it over, and that, that, could be, that could pretty much, we could sell that as a slab of spare ribs. Um, I could come back and take this, this connective tissue off, but it looks so nice like that, we're not gonna do anything with it. So we're gonna let that go. Uh, when I roll, when I go to sell them, what I generally do is I roll them up, and if I have that little bit of cartilage in there, I'll just cut through it. And generally, it'll cut. If it won't cut, you just give it a little score there, and fold it over like that, and then it just looks super sexy in your meat case. Sexy spare ribs. You can't say that very much, so uh, you gotta get it in when you can. So now we have our bacon and our loin. Done with the software now. So this is the bacon. This is a full-on pork belly. Uh, and this is, uh, pork belly It recently has taken on a whole new meaning. It's not just bacon anymore. Um, and part of the reason is because it has a good amount of connective tissue, but most importantly, it has this incredible fat. Uh, when cooked weight, generally, when cooked right, generally a, a long, slow roast or whether it's been brined and smoked, it just, that fat absorbs a tremendous amount of flavor and translates to many different applications. Um, one great application is cooking it low and slow and then chilling it and then you can actually cut it and you can grill it So it gives you an opportunity to get the most out of it that way. This chunk of fat right here uh, Is basically solid fat. So we're just going to trim that off to make it and it, it's what it's bother What's bothering me right here is it's not square <laughs> That's my own weirdness. So uh, I'm going to take that off Square that up and then I'll put the skin any skin that I'm not going to roast or use. I put that in my, my um, bone pile because the skin translates to it's collagen rich and it's gonna be great in your stock and give you a really nice thickness. Uh, so that goes to the bone pile. Uh, and this is our bacon. Basically, this is ready, this is ready to go. Um, I also like to leave the skin on the bacon until, uh, until the last minute when I, when I take it off. Um, uh, it gives me an opportunity to provide structure for the rest of the bacon underneath. It's relatively fatty, so it gives me a little security there. I can also slow roast the skin and get that nice and crispy so that becomes another garnish that I can use in the dish later on so that I'm not wasting any part of it. So that's my bacon. Now, if you have a smokehouse where you can incorporate a bacon that's this long, that's awesome. I don't, uh, so I generally just cut it in half. And then uh, I get bacon hooks, so I'll brine it for three to five days. Um, and then once I have it brined, uh, then I put my bacon hook in it and the bacon hook just hooks through the skin. It stretches it up like this. Uh, and then I'll air dry it for a good three to four hours to get a good pellicle. And then I'll smoke it. If I have a cold smoker, I'll cold smoke it for eight to 12 hours at around 55 to 85 degrees. And then I'll finish it in a hot smoker. Um, so it's a lengthy process, but when you slice the bacon off and you cook it in the pan, it's worth every minute. So it's delicious. That's, that's an awesome, that's Lord pretty. Lardon, pretty bacon, huh? Lardon. I, Lardon? Can you? Do I have a Lardon? No, I'm good. <laughs> no. It's a little personal. The French term is Lardon. Oh, Lardon. Okay, so yeah, a Lardon basically, you gotta put it in perspective. Uh, a Lardon is like a, a, a batonet of meat, kind of. Uh, okay. So, and that's where it gets nice and crispy. Great for salads and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, so that's the bacon? Yeah, he can do that. Yeah. Or not. We don't have to worry about uh, charging now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 